couple weeks in Sunday school, and I said we were going to do it. So since they're going out in a minute anyway, we'll do all my hope is in Jesus. So all the children, come on. They'll do two up and two rounds, and uh, we'll stand and do it. Well.
grace that's greater than all my sin. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I've never seen him raise the dead, but I know he lifted me. Amen. If we were charismatic church, I'd have got up and run around. <laughs> if I was 20 years younger, I might still would have got up and run <laughs> Luke chapter 19, as we move into our next chapter. And the, the text and the story this morning will cover verses 1 through 10. I doubt we'll get through all of them, but we'll go as far as we can go. But the entire section is 1 through 10, so we'll read that this morning as our text. And Jesus entered, passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. Well, again, we're thankful for our service thus far, Lord, and Lord, uh, as the songs have lifted you up and our hearts are prepared, we pray now, Lord, that uh, your word would enter in and the Holy Spirit would work in each one of us. And that, Lord, we would all be faithful and obedient to that Holy Spirit and to your word this morning, realizing that, uh, as Brother Hill often said, we all stand in need this morning and uh, you are a meter of all needs. And so we just turn everything over to you. And Lord, we just praise you this morning for who you are and for the joy of salvation. It's in yeah. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we get to a, a familiar story, familiar to us, because uh, a long time ago we all learned Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Oh, we remember that. Good. Amen. Well, here's the story. It's where the song comes from. Uh, Unlike the last story we did in Luke, at the end of 18, Luke didn't go into great detail, just said a certain blind man, but we knew from Mark that it was Bartimaeus that we were talking about. Well, here he does opposite. Luke gets very descriptive and gives us a lot of details about this encounter that's going to take place between Jesus Christ and Zacchaeus. The, the verse that we're working towards is that 10th verse that's still on your screen. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is a seeker. From all the way back in the beginning of Genesis, after Adam and Eve have uh, partaken of the forbidden fruit and they are hiding themselves as Jesus comes to walk through the garden in the cool of the day and he begins to call out and ask Adam where are you at? Or Adam where art thou? God was seeking them then he's still seeking today. He is seeking Zacchaeus here and we know that God wants to seek and to save that which is lost. We go back to the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 16. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. You can read the rest of the verse, but that main part, that first part, I'll seek that which was lost. And that's Jesus' exact quote and what he says at the end of our text. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost or is lost. Romans chapter 3. We know that, that God has to seek us because we're not really seeking Him. In Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as it's written, there's none righteous, 
No, not one. And then verse 11 says, there's none that understandeth, and here's that phrase, there's none that seeketh after God. It doesn't say there's a few that seek after God. It says there's none that seeketh after God. God does the seeking, and God does the saving. Whether we want to agree with it or not, we're like Adam and Eve. When God comes around, we want to hide in our shame, but he's looking for us. He's seeking us. And Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. God's perfect plan of salvation. God sent Jesus to a lost and dying people to save those people from himself, from God's own wrath and God's own judgment. When it says to seek and save that which is lost. That word lost doesn't just mean I can't find it. It means ruined. It means destroyed. Jesus came to rescue us from being destroyed. Amen. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I wish Brandon would have said that the other night. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. Go back to the birth of Jesus. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall what? Save his people from their sins. Paul, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, a familiar scripture. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It's only been a few weeks ago that we were back in Luke chapter 15. And if you'll remember in Luke chapter 15, there were three parables that we looked at. Two shorter, one really long one. But they all dealt with the same uh, uh, topic in the same order. We had a, a shepherd who had lost his sheep. One of his sheep left all to go find that sheep. We had a woman who had lost a coin in her home, stopped everything to find that coin. And then we had a father who had lost his son and sought after his son, uh, the prodigal son, that being the longer one there at the end of chapter 15. But as we look at those, we kind of concentrated more on the joy of being found and what it meant to be found. And this morning we're kind of going to look at the joy of the seeker and the glory of the seeker. Because God seeks to save the lost for his own joy and for his own glory. Why in the world he would enjoy saving a rotten sinner like me, I don't know. But I'm glad I don't have to understand it. I just got to accept it and be glad of it. He seeks to save you. If you are saved this morning, he sought you to save you. People say, well, I, I was looking for Jesus. Well, let me tell you this. I go back. Romans says this. There's none that seeketh after him. If you're seeking after Jesus because Jesus has been seeking after you and the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. But if he's not seeking after you and the Spirit's not working in your heart, then you're not going to want to seek him. John put it this way in 1 John 4, 19. We know this scripture uh, very familiar. We love him because he first loved us. We seek him because he first seeks us. In this story today, Jesus seeks Zacchaeus out of nowhere. A man that had nothing going for him at all, especially among religious elite and what people would have considered to be the top notch of all the religious people. He was scum to them. And yet Jesus seeks him out. So we'll, we'll start in, a, in our section this morning again. We'll go as far as we can go. Going back to the text and in verse 1, Jesus here passed through Jericho. Remember, we, we talked about this last week, so we won't stay on long, but he's coming into Jericho. He's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. This is the Jericho of the Old Testament where the walls came down, same city. At this point, very beautiful place. Everything in the world going for it. I uh, read this week where uh, one historian called it the Eden of Palestine. I mean, it was the, the, the nicest, prettiest place you could see or find, and Jesus is now coming in. We, we, we mentioned the last week, the crowds are getting bigger. 
Word is getting out. He's getting close to Jerusalem. More people are following him. It's just been a few weeks since he raised Lazarus from the dead. That word's gotten out. There are folks who've been following him, and there are more and more getting behind, trying to find him, trying to see him, trying to be a part of what's going on. And just typical, as it would be nowadays, when you got somebody uh, of that kind of fame coming through town, folks are going to show up in that town to see him and see what all the ruckus is about. Remember, Bartimaeus, he didn't... He couldn't see him, but he heard all the commotion as Jesus was coming. He wanted to know what in the world's going on. Well, folks want to know what in the world's going on as Jesus is coming into Jericho. So folks are coming from everywhere to see this miracle man. Huge, huge crowds. Now we meet uh, uh, our Zacchaeus in verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. We know what a publican is. We've covered this many times. A tax collector. So he's a, a tax collector and he's rich. Luke likes talking about tax collectors. This is the sixth time we've come into contact with a tax collector. Only one had a name, though. That was Matthew. All those have just been referred to as publicans. And now we're going to get to Zacchaeus. He's also going to be named. We'll talk about that more in a second. But remember... Jews hated publicans. They hated tax collectors. Not just like you hate the IRS. Not, 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 well, we, we, know, we just learned to hate, hate the IRS. But these folks were corrupt, dishonest thieves and robbers. Much like the IRS. Never mind. Which, but it, there's a hatred there. It's a national hatred. It's deep seated. It's passed on from generation to generation. And, and you understand why. In order to be a tax collector, you had to buy that office from the Romans. So you are a Jew who is going out and paying for an office that you can then in turn turn around and collect money from your fellow Jews. Traitors. Jews hated Rome. They hated being occupied by Rome. They hated everything about the Romans. And here you are, a Jew giving money to the Romans so that you can in turn turn around and take money from your own brethren and kinsmen. You're the lowest of the, you can't get worse than that. Remember we talked last week, folks thought blind folks were bad, unclean. God had judged them for their sin. But the only thing lower than a blind man was a publican. Well, here we've gotten to the lower rung with Zacchaeus, the publican. The problem was not just that they took your money, but everybody knew they were corrupt in taking your money. In other words, the Romans would say, okay, you are the publican, you are the collector. You must take this amount of money, this percentage of money from everybody in your province, in your section that you are in charge of. But anything you take past that, you get to keep. Well, nobody knew what the percentage was except the publicans. So let's just say, we'll make it easy math. You got $1,000, and Romans say we get 10%, so you owe Rome $100, but you don't really know what the percentage is, and your publican comes to you and says, you owe 20%, give me $200, you give them $200, are you going to jail? Well, 100 is going to the Romans, and 100 is going in Mr. Publican's back pocket. Well, anytime you start dealing with money, corruption is going to find its way in. Money messes everything up. You just look at families, that are close knit, and then somebody with money in the family dies, and everybody goes pulling out knives and fighting and robbing and stealing over who's going to get their section and their what. Money messes everything up. Well, money messed this whole system up. The publicans were corrupt because they could be, and they could get away with it. You couldn't do anything about it. Still sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So here's Zacchaeus, but he's not just any publican. Luke tells us he's the chief publican. He's at the top of the totem pole. He is numero uno. He's at the top. It's a pyramid scheme, and he's the top of the pyramid. Every publican under him, whatever they collect extra, he's getting part of it too. So he is very rich, as Luke tells us. He says he's chief among publicans, and he 
is rich. Now, Zacchaeus' parents had a good little plan for him. Because the name Zacchaeus actually means this. Clean, innocent, pure, and righteous. Well, I think he missed the mark on what his parents intended for him to be. It didn't turn out quite like they wanted. But again, other than Matthew, we, we don't ever see a public name until we get here and we get this named person, Zacchaeus. I'll go back to last week again, to Barnabas as our example. Most scholars agree the reason that Barnabas gets named in Mark is because people reading that gospel in the first century as Christianity is, is exploding and the word is getting out there, they would know who Barnabas was. So he gets named because he was already a prominent Christian and people could put two and two together and say, oh yeah, that's Barnabas. I know Barnabas. Well, the same thing is said about Zacchaeus. The reason Luke names Zacchaeus by name is because the people reading Luke's gospel would hear that name and know it. They knew who Zacchaeus was. The reason they knew it is because not only did he get saved, not only did he turn his life around, not only did he forsake his corrupt ways, but he ended up, not Bible, but church historians who are, for the most part, straight up correct on the things they tell us. Church historians tell us Zacchaeus ended up being a pastor at a church in Caesarea. So he went from being the evil of the worst, unclean you could be, to being a New Testament Christianity preacher at a church in Caesarea. And everybody in that region knew, hey, that's Zacchaeus. He's a pastor. He used to be a tax collector. I wonder today what do people say about you? Can they say what you are now as compared to what you used to be? That's a great testimony. Zacchaeus used to be, and now he is a pastor. Again, he's the chief, he's the top, he's rich because of it. He's what the folks around and the Jews would call a sinner, unclean, defiled, outcast. And as a Jew, you aren't supposed to go near him or else you could be defiled by just being in proximity of him. Being a publican, being a traitor, he was not allowed to go into synagogue could not go in. Again, would allow something unclean to come into the synagogue. So, he's shunned by Jews. He can't go in the synagogue. He's extremely rich, but it really doesn't do him any good other than just having a, a comfortable life. But socially, the only friends he's going to have are other publicans, other corrupt tax folks, because they're in the same boat he is. Nobody else He's going to have anything to do with him. He's just like a leper. Stay out of camp. Stay away from us. We don't want anything to do with you. Verse 3 tells us, though, that he's seeking to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus, who he was. He wants to find out about this miracle man that all the word has gotten out about that is now coming through his town of Jericho. But, as we know from singing as youngsters, he's got a problem. He's got two problems. One, the crowd is big. And two, he's a little man. So we got a big crowd and a little fella can't see Jesus for the press. Everybody's pressed together. Folks are everywhere. Everybody's tied in so he can't look through and see that way. And he's too small to see above everybody. That's a problem. Years ago, when we got married, years ago, first got into to coaching and uh, there was a big basketball playoff game going on in Bibb County. At that time, Bibb County was undefeated and they had these just stud players. And I wanted to go see it firsthand. Well, Bibb County gym, not a very big gym, and it was packed. We got there, me and I get there, and there's not a seat available. So what they did was, true standing room only, they stuck you around the court. 
you were literally standing. You had the court to take a play, and then a foot off of it was people. And we were third row back in that. So we're there, and I made poor Valerie sit through the entire basketball game, and the only thing she could see was some poor guy's shoulder blades on her nose, but she couldn't see anything. I was tall enough, I could look over and watch. She had to watch some guy's shoulders for an hour and a half. It was a great game, though. Same problem. That kid can't see. Can't see you. Can't look through. Can't look over. Just because he's a small guy. Well, He's pretty smart, though. Verse 4 tells us what he did. Again, we remember from the song. He ran <coughs> forward, got out of here, and found him a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. He knew that the crowd's going to keep coming this way, down this street, so he runs ahead, climbs up in a, a sycamore tree. American sycamore tree is a little different than what the sycamore tree that's, that's referenced here in Israel during Jesus' time. Uh, most scholars will tell you it's what they refer to as a mulberry tree. The idea, though, is this particular tree, especially Middle Easterners, would know. Huge trunk with huge limbs coming off of it, and it grew kind of squatty to the ground. So it was easy to climb and get up because the limbs were big and thick. You could get a hold and it would hold you up and you could climb up in one. Brad's got a couple of pictures to give us an example. There's one that's not quite so low, but you kind of see how big the branches are. And then the next one, Brad, gives you a little bit more of an idea about how those things grew. So you can see easily how a guy that's not so big could shimmy up that tree and get up there and get him a good vantage point and be able to see. Climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. So Zacchaeus is up in that tree. So he said, he's ready. He's going to see this Jesus. Remember, he is seeking to see Jesus who he was. Verse 5 tells us, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. Well, of course he looked up because that's where Zacchaeus is at. He's up. Jesus looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. <coughs> I love the fact that when Jesus gets to that tree, he already knows Zacchaeus is in the tree. Now again, you got the press, you got everything going around, there's people everywhere, there's a crowd. I, I wouldn't think to look up in a tree. Well, Jesus didn't have to think to look up in a tree because they already knew he was there. And even better than that, he didn't say, hey man, come down. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Let me tell you something. Jesus knows your name. Amen. He knows your name. Zacchaeus come down. He looks at him. That's astonishing to Zacchaeus that he would even notice him. Because again, Zacchaeus is not the kind of guy that wants to get noticed. He's a publican. He's a guy that people shun. He's a pariah to society. So he likes to try to keep as low key as possible. So the fact that Jesus even looks at him, number one, is an astonishment then that he calls him by his name is an astonishment. And then, to top it all off, he doesn't just call him by his name, but he tells him to come down. And the reason he needs to come down is because I'm going to your house today. That's the song. <laughs> I'm coming to your house, that is. You're about to have company. Boy, that kid's never had that kind of company before. Because again, folks hated him. Folks didn't want to be around him. Verse 6 tells us, and he made haste. The Lord said, come down here in a hurry. He got down in a hurry. He made haste, came down, and received him joyfully. Verse 7 says that when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Yeah. Zacchaeus, come down. For today, Jesus doesn't just know your name. 
He knows when you're going to get saved. He knows where it's going to happen. Today, I'm coming to your house. And you'll notice in that verse 5 how he said it. For today I must abide at thy house. I must. What's making it must? God's making it must. Yeah. God has lined this up and set it up. And I'm coming to abide. That means he's going to spend the night. He's not just coming in to say hey and get out of there. He's coming to spend the night. Yeah. Well, how do you really know that he says abide? How do you know it means to spend the night? Well, because in verse 7 when it says, and when they saw it, they all murmured saying that he was gone to be guest. The word there that gets translated gone to be guest means he changed into his bed clothes. He came and he meant to stay and he made himself at home and he got ready to spend the night. Oh, the horror. Jews everywhere. Just cannot believe. We've been following this guy. He raised Lazarus from the dead. We're really thinking he's the Messiah. There's no way he's the Messiah if he's going to go spend the night with a traitor, unclean, defiled tax collector. You would think they would say, look at this man. Yeah. He saves everybody. Yeah. This is great. Look at the, as Crystal saying, grace that he just gave to somebody that didn't deserve it. No, uh -huh. they're murmuring. Because yeah. church folks murmur. Yeah, they can. <laughs> <laughs> they murmuring. Look what he's doing. I, I can't believe that. I can't believe she wore that jersey. I can't believe he sat in my seat. I can't believe. Murmurings. Yeah. No joy amongst the people. Who had the joy? <laughs> Jesus had the joy. And Zacchaeus had the joy. Verse 6, he made haste, came down and received him joyfully. You know what? Zacchaeus could have cared less what everybody else thought at this point. Yeah. And Jesus could have cared less too. Yes, Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but much more important than that, Jesus wanted to see Zacchaeus. And he did. And he came down and received him Joyful. Well, what happens next? We'll hit it in two weeks, Lord willing. If he hadn't come back by then, we'll finish this little section and we'll see more about what happens with good old Zacchaeus. Let's stand. While Denise comes with a verse of the invitation, Sandra, come. Open the altar up this morning. If you're here today and you've never been saved, let me tell you something. The Lord is seeking you. And he's working on you right now with the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you've never been saved, let me tell you something. Today, as Jesus told Zacchaeus, it's time you need to get saved. Yeah. And you don't have to climb up in a sycamore tree to get saved. Instead, you just need to get down in an altar and give your life to him. Amen. And call upon his name and you shall be saved. Amen. While we sing, verse 10 to 65.
Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Make your plans to be with us. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to try our best to finish up chapter 6 tonight. We've opened five seals. We're going to get to the sixth seal tonight and try our best to finish out that chapter. So make your plans to be with us at 6 o'clock tonight uh, for that service. Well, Sam, would you dismiss us? Father God, thank you so much for...